In this video, we are learning about two very interesting phenomena. One is speech and one is cerebral asymmetry. Let us begin with cerebral asymmetry first. We know that left cerebral hemisphere controls the activity of the contralateral half of the body, that is right half of the body, and right hemisphere likewise controls the activities of the left half of the body. Left hemisphere receives information about right half of the visual field, right hemisphere receives information about left half of the visual field. But this is just distribution of functions. This is not what we mean by cerebral asymmetry. When we say cerebral asymmetry, there are certain functions which left hemisphere is capable of and the right is not and vice versa. So let us find out what they are. Now left hemisphere is involved in verbal or linguistic description. It's a ver verbal function basically. It's involved in speech. Whereas right hemisphere is almost non-verbal and it has musical abilities. Left hemisphere is involved in arithmetic part of the mathematics and also in sequential thinking. Whereas right hemisphere is involved in geometrical analysis, spatial comprehension and temporal synthesis. Left hemisphere is involved in linear analytical thinking. It's more of an individual small scale thinking to the point. The A leads to B leads to C. Like now during this period of COVID, if I leave my home and go out without a mask, I may be caught by a policeman and I may have to either pay my fines or get arrested. Now that's a very linear analytical thinking. Whereas right hemisphere is more involved in holistic and gestalt thinking. Holistic in the sense, the same example, we know that if each one from home get out without a mask, soon the entire country or entire world will be full of people affected by COVID. So we are using the small information together and thinking it in a larger scale. That is done by the right hemisphere. Left hemisphere is involved in storing verbal memory and right hemisphere in storing non-verbal memory. Apart from this functional asymmetry, there are also anatomical variations between left and right side, both macro and microscopic. Left hemisphere has a larger planum temporal. This is the gyrus present on the posterior aspect of superior surface of the superior temporal gyrus, just behind the primary auditory area. Because that planum temporal is larger, the left hemisphere also has longer lateral sulcus, that is posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus, and also it is more horizontally oriented as compared to the right side. Left hemisphere has a wider occipital pole. It has got more large number, large pyramidal cells in area 45. It also has larger area around central sulcus because most people being right-handed, both pre-central and post-central gyrus in that region will be larger. And for some unknown reason, the left hemisphere also has more neurons in entorhinal cortex, which is actually an olfactory area. On the contrary, the right hemisphere has a wider frontal pole. Just follow this simple instruction. There are multiple words written here using different font colors. Just say the color of the font, not the word itself. Now, this is one of the very simple exercise which establishes left-right conflict. The right brain tries to say the color of the word, whereas the left brain insists on reading the word. Now coming to speech. In fact, if you notice, in two ways we stand apart based upon our action. One is the ability to speak. To communicate through language and second one is the dexterity of our hands. So speech is one of the very highly specialized functions that human beings have. There are various speech centers located in the brain. Now in 90% of the people these speech centers are located on the left hemisphere which is also known as dominant hemisphere. In most of these people it will coincide that left hemisphere also will be controlling the right hand and those people seem uh, happen to be right-handed people.
But mind you, these two are not connected. It's quite a possibility that a person may be right-handed but may have his speech centers on the right side. So let us find out what are, what are the speech centers available. In the dominant hemisphere, we have area 44-45 located within the inferior frontal gyrus in the area which was labeled as pars triangularis and pars opercularis between anterior horizontal and anterior ascending and posterior rami of the lateral sulci. Now this area 44-45 is known as Broca's motor speech area. It's involved in triggering speech production or expression of language. Then we have Wernicke's sensory speech area. Here I am showing it enclosing parts of area number 22, 39 and 40. 22 is located in the superior temporal gyrus. It is the higher association area for auditory modality or auditory pathway. 39 is the angular gyrus. It is the higher association area for the visual pathway. 40 is the supramarginal gyrus. It is the higher association area for the somatosensory pathway. However, Wernicke sensory area, sensory speech area has been variably described by different authors. Some people take only area 22 to be Wernicke's area. But we are going to continue taking both, I mean all the three areas that is parts of area 22, 39 and 40. So what is the role of this sensory speech area? It receives visual and spoken speech and speech is comprehended here. The motor speech area and sensory speech area connect with each other by a fiber bundle that is association fiber bundle that is known as arcuate fasciculus. Now these centers are present in only one hemisphere. So in most right handed people it is located in the left hemisphere. Now so what happens to these areas on the contralateral hemisphere? So corresponding areas on the right side are involved in prosody. That is, they are sensitive to cadence. Cadence is just any change in the inflection or intonation of the words. It is involved in nuances. Nuances is different shades of words, like meaning of words. Like, I can say I am upset with you, I am angry with you, I am furious with you, I am hopping mad with you. So there are different gradations which are expressed here. So it is capable of understanding that. And it is also un involved in understanding emphasis, whether there is a question mark associated with the sentence, whether there is an exclamatory mark associated with the sentence. So emphasis is also understood by similar areas on the right side. The right side is also involved in creative elements in language, like you are creating a joke, you are creating poetry. So again, these are the areas involved, but they are per se not involved in direct production of speech, production or comprehension of speech. Some interesting factors, if you are learning different languages before the age of 7 years, that information is stored in the overlapping area, whereas if you learn languages after age of 7 years, different languages are stored in separate areas. Now that actually works as an advantage because if there is a focal lesion involving any one part of that area which is storing languages, you will lose the ability for only that one language but other languages will be spared. Then another interesting factor here, I will be showing you the various areas which are active when you are passively listening, that is area number 41, 42 which are the auditory area and auditory association area, area 22 which is the higher association area for the auditory pathway and area 9 which is supervisory attention system, whenever we are awake and alert, if you are doing something whether it is hearing talking, reading, this area becomes active. So these are the areas which are active when you are listening to speech passively. But when you are paying attention and listening, that is active listening, not only these areas will be activated, but even the areas 21, 37, 39, 44, 45 and 46, those areas will also light up. So much larger area of cerebral cortex will be active when you are actively listening thereby you have a higher chance of retaining this information that's why when you're actively paying attention to when you're listening in the class you will remember a lot more things than when you're passively listening 
Now let us talk about how the spoken and visual speech is processed. The spoken speech is processed through what is known as phonological pathway. The areas involved are marked in red color here. So first area number 41 and 42 that is auditory primary auditory area and auditory association area they are involved in phoneme retrieval. What do we mean by phoneme retrieval? They just register the sound made by the words spoken. They do not attach any meaning to it. They do not attach any sense to it. They just register the way the words are being sounded. Now this information is shifted to area numbers 21 in the middle temporal gyrus, 22 which is the higher association area for the auditory pathway, 37 which is at the junction between audit, uh, temporal and the occipital lobes and 39 which is the angular gyrus. Now here we have what is known as semantic retrieval. Semantic retrieval is these words are put together to first make a sound word and those meaning of these words are established. That is what we call as semantic retrieval especially when we are talking about semantic retrieval the semantic word is used for meaning of a verb or a noun. The information is also sent to 44 and 45 where there is syntax retrieval. What do we mean by syntax retrieval? It helps in retrieving the conjunctions like in a sentence we have words like in, of, or, and. So they will connect the uh, semantics to make it into a meaningful sentence. So for that connection the information is also sent to 44 and 45. This is how the spoken speech is understood. So first phonemic retrieval done at the auditory areas. Then it is sent to higher association area as well as to angular gyrus for semantic retrieval. And for syntax retrieval it will be sent to Broca's area. Now coming to the visual speech or reading. Now that's a little more complicated pathway. So area numbers 17, 18 and 19 that is the primary and secondary visual areas they are involved in grapheme retrieval basically they are just seeing the letter whether it is written with a straight line horizontal line dot bump or any curvatures so that is understood by this area number 17, 18 and 19 they do not have an idea about alphabets per se. This information is then sent to V4 that is the anterior part of the area number 19 for orthographic processing whether the uh, letters are written correctly or not. So that processing is done in V4 area. Then this information is sent to area number 20 in the inferior temporal gyrus including even the fusiform gyrus which is on the inferior surface that is the lateral occipital temporal gyrus. So here it retrieves written word or lexeme retrieval. So the words letters are put side by side to make words. Now this information is then transferred to 21 in the middle temporal gyrus and area number 39 for phonological processing. What do we mean by phonological processing? Some words are pronounced as they are spelt, dog, caught. Some words are pronounced little differently like rough, though, thought. So that phonological processing is done in area number 21 and 39. Then the information is processed in area number 37, 39, 40 and 45 for semantic retrieval. So again the meaning of the words are established here or it is retrieved from the memory stored from the earlier exposure. Then there are a set of areas that is area number 44, 45, Broca's area, motor area 4, premotor area 6, supplementary motor area as well as contralateral cerebellum. All the activity in all these areas together will result in what is known as subvocal articulation or inner speech. You take any book right now at this point of time, pause the video, start reading. You will suddenly observe that when as you are reading through the sentence, mentally you are actually speaking it. It may not be loud but it's the inner speech. So for that activity to happen, these area numbers 44, 45, 4, 6, as well as supplementary motor area and the contralateral cerebellum, they will all be active. So once this is done, now till this point what have we got? We have heard or we have read a particular language. We have understood the meaning of the words heard or words read. Now what happens is the next sequence. This information is shifted to inferior parietal lobule which includes both angular gyrus 39 and supramarginal gyrus area number 40. 
Now that is where a context or importance is attached to what we are hearing or what we are, what we are reading. From there, the information is then shifted to, I mean, of course, even throughout this process, the information is being shifted to area number nine, which is the supervisory attention area. So it pays attention to what is being spoken or what is being read. Information is also sent to limbic lobe and prefrontal cortex. That is to find out if there is any emotional significance to what we are hearing or what we are reading. Then the information is sent to, or rather it is processed by, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Now there, there is a goal-directed decision being made. That's what is called as macro planning. So the brain decides based upon what we are hearing or what we are reading, should we take any action to respond back? That's the macro planning. If the decision is yes, then it will send information to the Broca's area 44-45, where the Broca's area selects the appropriate words and appropriate syntax to make it into a sentence, that is semantic and syntax selection. This is the micro planning. So it says now uh, this, is the, this should be the response for the particular question asked. So once that is done, this information is then shifted to the motor cortex area 4, which is just adjacent to this area 44-45 because that is the area where head is represented in the motor homunculus. So when it sends the information, that motor cortex will initiate movements of the muscles involved in speech. They, it will send the information down through the corticonuclear fibers to reach the larynx, pharynx and tongue and lip, that is facial muscles, so as to make the speech be articulated. It also sends information throughout when this speech is happening, throughout this length of time, the temporal lobes are constantly doing what is known as meta-analysis, that is area number 20, 21 and 22. They are constantly hearing, that is we are constantly hearing our own speech to keep checking whether what we are talking is correct or wrong. So it prevents slip of tongue. The information from Broca's area is also sent to supplementary motor area if in case the way in which we want to respond is through writing and not verbalizing. So this is how the entire speech is being processed. We receive the information either through hearing, that is spoken speech, or visual speech, that is through reading, that is not only first processed, it is understood, then shifted to the various area in the cortex which decides whether we have to respond or not. Once it is decided to respond, how it has to be re responded, that information, that decision will be taken at the Broca's area, which is then transferred to motor areas or supplementary motor area to either verbalize or either to write. It's a very interesting and if you notice, actually it is the speech which sets us apart. We communicate much more meaningfully and exhaustively. Like the amount of literature we have produced just by our ability for language is simply astounding. So that's what probably makes us a superior species compared to other animals. So putting this language processing in a simple format, so hearing that is spoken speech as well as reading that is visual speech are first sent to Wernicke's area for comprehension. From the Wernicke's area, it is either transferred through arcuate fasciculus, that which, is a, which is a simple fiber bundle which helps in repetition, or it is processed in the angular gyrus and other conceptual centers which are located in the temporal lobe, parietal lobe and the frontal lobe. Through one of these two pathways, the information from Wernicke's area is shifted to Broca's area. Now in the Broca's area, once the decision is made that it has to respond, it will be either responding through speech or through writing. So if these many parts are involved in the speech or language processing, things can go wrong at any of these pathways. So if there is a lesion between the hearing area and the Wernicke's area, that is the connection between the auditory area and the Wernicke's area, it results in what is known as pure word deafness. Usually the lesion will be in area 22, that's a higher association area for auditory function. Here, the primary auditory area and auditory association area, that is area number 41 and 42 are intact. So patient can hear but the patient is unable to understand the spoken speech because he is not able to transfer that information to the Wernicke's area. So that's what is called as pure word deafness. Similarly, if there is 
connection loss between the visual area and the connection with the Wernicke's area that will result in alexia or word blindness. In fact, alexia is a very big topic. There are lot of reasons and lot of areas involved in case of inability to read. But I am just giving a couple of examples here. If there is alexia without agraphia, that is a patient is unable to read but patient can write. Now that will be most often because of the lesion to the left sided posterior cerebral artery. Therefore left visual cortex will be having a problem. So therefore it is not sending information to the angular gyrus forwards. So here the patient cannot read but he has no problem writing. The other one is alexia and agraphia. Patient can't read, can't write. So that is often because of the lesion to the angular gyrus itself. Then we have Wernicke's area lesion that is resulting in Wernicke's aphasia otherwise known as sensory aphasia. This is an interesting condition wherein patient's speech has normal fluency in fact it is very fluent but patient has lost comprehension of his speech. He is not aware of his deficiency. Semantics are lost that is he cannot pick appropriate words but syntax is intact that is the conjunctions which should join the words that is going to be intact. He tries to fill up the loss of his semantics by using what is called a semantic paraphasia or phonemic paraphasia that is he uses a word instead of the required word he uses some other word like I eat breakfast can be I drink breakfast that kind that is a semantic paraphasia. Phonemic paraphasia is instead of one word he uses another word which sounds similar like I eat with spoon can be said as I eat with moon. So that's a phonemic paraphasia. Plus he has lot of neologisms. Neologisms are new words which is invented on the whim. They are absolutely meaningless resulting in jargon aphasia. So it has got lot of meaningless words within his speech. One example I have given here. I called my mother on the bobber for sleeping the breakfast yesterday. I got a new chef eyes and I am drawing a new fish. Makes no sense but he speaks this sentence fluently. In his mind it's making sense. And he's unaware that this makes no sense to anyone else. That's the Wernicke's aphasia. Complete contrast to this is the Broca's aphasia that is injury to Broca's area. Here the speech is telegraphic that is slow labored speech. Patient has got absolutely intact comprehension but his fluency is lost and patient is also painfully aware of his deficiency. His semantics are intact that is he chooses the correct words but his syntax is lost he cannot join them with proper conjunctions. One example is I eat breakfast morning. Now he wanted to say I ate my breakfast in the morning but the words spoken would be I eat breakfast morning. So semantics are intact but syntax will be lost. Then we have what is known as aphemia. Here Broca's area is normal but Broca's area's connection with the motor area is lost. So there is disturbance of motor verbal output. There is normal expression via written language. Auditory and written comprehension is intact. He is just not able to verbalize. The next ex uh, extension of this problem is the dysarthria. Or there can be Similarly, agraphia, the patient can speak normally but he is unable to write. That says connection with the supplementary motor area will be lost. Then coming to the areas connecting Wernicke's with the Broca's area. Now going through the upper pathway that is the portion connecting Wernicke's area to angular gyrus. If there is lesion there, it will result in transcortical sensory aphasia. If there is lesion to the pathway connecting angular gyrus and conceptual centers with the Broca's area, we get transcortical motor aphasia. If there is lesion to the angular gyrus and the various conceptual centers, that is transcortical mixed aphasia. So what are the features of this transcortical aphasia? Transcortical sensory aphasia will have features of Wernicke's aphasia. Transcortical motor aphasia will have features of Broca's aphasia. Transcortical mixed aphasia will have features of both Wernicke's and Broca's features. But the only way to differentiate this from the actual Wernicke's or Broca's aphasia is the patient has intact repetition. Tell a sentence, ask the patient to repeat, he repeats it normally. But otherwise his own speech will have features of Wernicke's aphasia or Broca's aphasia. So this is how you identify transcortical sensory aphasia. Again 
complete contrast is if there is a lesion to the acute fasciculus. Here, comprehension is intact, spoken speech is normal, but patient loses the ability to repeat. So if you ask him to repeat a sentence, he won't be able to do that. The rest will be normal. So these are the various aphasias or inability to express language in case of defects at different levels. Then we have what is known as global aphasia. Now that entire frontal and parietal part of the temporal area will be supplied by middle cerebral artery. So if there is lesion to the middle cerebral artery of the side supplying the dominant hemisphere or the area which is supplying, uh, controlling speech, both, both Broca's and Wernicke's areas are affected. Connecting arcuate fasciculus is affected. So the patient shows features of both Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia plus repetition will be lost. So this is what we call as global aphasia. So as I said, speech is an interesting thing and that is one way in which we communicate meaningfully with the rest of the world. So learning about how brain controls speech is an interesting exercise. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please visit this site for other neuroanatomy videos. Thank you very much.